Good evening and welcome to the first spring event of 2021 here at the Young Center for Anabaptist and Pietist Studies at Elizabethtown College in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. I'm Steve Nolt, Interim Director of the Young Center, and so glad that each of you could join us this evening for this event. With the support of Elizabethtown College, the Young Center fosters and promotes the study of Anabaptist and Pietist movements as historical movements with ongoing historical, social, and religious dimensions and implications for our world. This evening, we look at the complicated spirituality of pietist conversion. Why did conversion, one of the most talked about themes of German pietism, become so problematic for insiders to describe and outsiders to interpret? We do so this evening by welcoming Dr. Jonathan Strom, recipient of the Dale W. Brown Book Award for Outstanding Scholarship in Anabaptist and Pietist Studies. In 2004, the Young Center established an annual award to honor and promote scholarship, um, books published within the last three years that make a substantial contribution to Anabaptist and Pietist studies. The award honors the significant contribution of Dale W. Brown, brethren scholar, uh, scholar of pietism and of peace theology, and friends of Dale Brown and his wife Lois have generously contributed funds uh, to this award. And this evening, we honor Dr. Jonathan uh, Strom for the, uh, his book, um, German Pietism and the Problem of Conversion, published in 2018 by Penn State University Press. Dr. Strom is Professor of Church History, Associate Dean of Faculty and Academic Affairs, and Director of International Initiatives at Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. He joined the Emory faculty in 1997, shortly after receiving his PhD in church history from the University of Chicago. His research and writing has focused on pietism, on the history of Protestant clergy, on the emergence of modern forms of piety and religious practice in uh, Europe and North America. He has written, written widely on the history of uh, clergy, lay religion, and reform movements in post-Reformation Germany. He's written many articles, uh, several books, and edited uh, at least two books, including Pietism and Community and Pietism in Germany and North America, 1680 to 1820, in addition to German Pietism and the Problem of Conversion, which we'll be hearing about this evening. A word about our logistics for this evening. Uh, in a moment, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Strom via a pre-recorded lecture. It's about 45 minutes in length. Uh, after which uh, Dr. Strom will be joining us for a live question and answer time. And you are welcome during the lecture or uh, afterward to offer questions uh, via the Q&A feature uh, that you'll see on Zoom, not the chat feature, but the Q&A uh, feature. And um, as, um, as we have time, uh, we will take up those questions that you have uh, submitted during the question and answer time. Now, uh, Let's hear from Dr. Strom on the complicated spirituality of pietism. It is such an honor to receive the Dale W. Brown Book Award, and I am pleased to be here this evening to talk with you about the complicated spirituality of pietist conversion that discusses some of the themes of my book. Conversion is at the core of much that is written about pietism, especially German pietism. The remarkably vivid conversion account of August Simon Franke is often portrayed as the quintessential religious experience in pietism. The centrality of conversion is not just true of church pietists like Franke, but of radical pietists as well, including Johann Heinrich Reitz, whose well-known collection of religious autobiography highlighted conversion accounts, especially in the first volumes. These conversion experiences put an emphasis on a decisive moment in the Christian's life in which he or she traveled from a lukewarm or nominal faith to true Christianity, an experience or set of experiences often told in dramatic terms. Conversion, which implies a fundamental change in direction and its related biologically based term of regeneration or new birth, have become hallmarks of descriptions of pietism and in a sense a mark of what sets modern Protestantism apart from the classic varieties of Protestantism that arose after the Reformation in the 16th century. But it also points at deep discomfort with religious experiences. As Americans, especially those immersed in contemporary Protestant traditions, we are quite familiar with the language of conversion. We use it both in concrete religious and spiritual settings but also in secular contexts, 
describing political conversions to describe personal transformations of policy views that require little further elaboration to underscore the connotations of their dramatic natures. And apart from any spiritual references whatsoever, we employ conversion in all kinds of ways to describe changes in function, converting a loft apartment or the conversion of currency, which have very little, if any, religious resonance. Of course, the prevalence of conversion in our contemporary vocabulary does not always lead to clarity when examining historical moments and sometimes clouds our own views of what conversion is, thinking we know it when we see it, to the extent that it can sometimes get in the way of our apprehending the, the historical realities. And it is worth noting that other languages do not treat conversion as we do. German has two words, the more traditional Bekehrung, that has almost a solely religious meaning, and the more expansive Konversion, a Latin derivative that is considerably less sectarian and ostensibly more social scientific, which has been increasingly displacing Bekehrung in scholarly literature on conversion. In an ironic turn, Konversion has been adopted by some German evangelicals who find Bekehrung no longer suitable because, as one theologian put it, its legacy is tainted, trying, and diseased, too religious, apparently, for authentic faith. When we talk about conversion in the historical context of pietism, there are roughly three different varieties. First, conversion can refer to the change in an individual's identity from one religious tradition to another, such as when a Jew is baptized and adopts Christianity, or a Christian becomes Muslim. Second, the division of Western Christendom in the 16th century and the emergence of Protestantism opened the possibility of a new form of conversion in the early modern era in which a Christian would reject a previous confessional identity and affiliate with a new confessional group, say for instance, when a Lutheran becomes Roman Catholic or a Catholic becomes a Mennonite. Third, conversion can represent an inward change of heart or powerful transformation in a nominal Christian whose faith subsequently becomes qualitatively different. This last mode is one of the most often associated with pietist conversion and what we will largely be discussing today. But pietists would have recognized all three modes as authentic conversion in which true Christianity is realized. To this, we as historians might add one other form of conversion that pietists would not have recognized as authentic but was present at the time, and that is unconversion away from a particular religious belief. And we already see several examples of this, including from the German pietist, as well as the British Methodist context in the 18th century. To understand why conversion experiences became important for many Protestants in the 17th and 18th centuries, we need to understand a little more about the Reformation tradition and its reluctance to focus on conversion experiences. Martin Luther, depicted here in the pulpit, and other reformers could talk about different forms of conversion intellectually, but they were very reluctant to speak of any form of explicit conversion experiences, and there are remarkably few conversion accounts that stem from either Reformed or Lutheran contexts in the 16th century. As David Steinmetz has argued, the Protestant reformers were very hesitant to identify conversion as involving any kind of preparation for grace. Grace came unmerited from God. So while conversion remained a category of theology and doctrine, it was not really identified with a decisive moment in the life of a Christian as she or he matured. The church historian Paul Althaus described it for Reformation era Lutherans in this way. Conversion or daily repentance is nothing other than the event of baptism realized continually in life. Notice the way Althaus links together baptism, conversion, and daily repentance. And in the image, you can see this centrality of baptism for Lutheran reformers. The joining of these represented an important way that German Protestants and especially Lutherans talked about conversion, identifying conversion, the Kehrung, with ongoing repentance, Busa. This is a theologically rich way of understanding conversion, and it builds especially off the sacramental understanding of Lutherans that infant baptism was the bath of regeneration or rebirth, following their understanding of Titus 3.5, which describes 
the water of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, which they almost universally associated with infant baptism. But it also contains some practical difficulties for understanding religious experience, especially in a society that was, at least ostensibly, confessionally uniform and required all infants to be baptized. Were there no distinctions among baptized Christians, some of whom seemed to lead patently unchristian lives? Could they merely claim repentance from their sins in a formal way and move on? Self-delusion was a problem, and indeed, how could one deal with outright hypocrites in this context? How would one describe a profound turn in the life of an individual towards true faith and true Christianity? This bumped up against the Lutheran understanding of conversion that saw it as something ongoing and continual since baptism. In the post-Reformation era, classic Protestantism, especially Lutheranism and Calvinism, struggled with the problem of religious complacency and to inculcate true piety. Lewis Bailey, an English Puritan, wrote a spiritual classic, The Practice of Piety, that was first published around 1612. Here's an image of the frontispiece. Bailey lambasted his fellow Protestants in England for their lack of piety. He wrote, O oh God, what sanctified heart can bleed to behold how seldom they come to prayers, how irreverently they hear God's word, what assiduous spectators they are at stage plays. This is the age of Shakespeare, where being Christians, they can sport themselves to hear the vassals of the devil scoffing religion. Never was there more sinning, never less remorse for sin. Bailey's devotional work was printed dozens and dozens of times throughout the 17th and 18th century and translated into many languages, including influentially into German. Right around the same time in Germany, Johann Arndt wrote the first of his famous books on true Christianity in 1606, another bestseller in Protestant spirituality of the 17th century. In the preface, he wrote, that the Holy Gospel is subjected in our time to a great and shameful abuse is fully proved by the impenitent life of the ungodly who praise Christ in his word with their mouths and yet lead an unchristian life that is like that of persons who dwell in heathendom, not in the Christian world. Such an ungodly conduct gave me cause to write this book to show simple readers wherein true Christianity consists namely in the exhibition of a true living faith, active in genuine godliness and the fruits of righteousness. For both Bailey and Arndt, religious experience became an important element of faith. British Puritans found their way more easily to conversion accounts as a way to describe pivotal religious experience. And by the mid 17th century, conversion or conversion-like accounts were common among Puritans, both in Britain and New England. Vavasor Powell's collection, Spiritual Experiences of Sundry Believers, published in 1653, contained many accounts of conversion. And of course, there is John Bunyan's classic autobiographical conversion account, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, the first edition of which appeared in 1666, and which he continued to expand over the later part of his life. German Protestants, and especially Lutherans, were different and took a longer time to get to outright conversion experiences. One of the main factors is the idea of baptismal regeneration that was a stumbling block. Since they didn't hold to baptismal re regeneration, it was easier for Calvinists and the broader reform tradition in Britain and elsewhere to find a way to accommodate religious conversions as part of the temporal description of the Christian life that corresponded with a regeneration later in life. German Lutherans were eventually able to resolve the issue in the 17th century. One reform-minded Lutheran, Theophil Grosgebauer, proposed in 1661 that they, like Calvinists, dispense with baptismal regeneration and in, and in turn emphasize the idea of definitive conversion experience once one had reached an age of discernment. This was, though, a bridge too far for most Lutherans and their high sacramental understanding of baptism. What then emerged in the 1670s, especially under the influence of one of the pioneering founders of German pietism, Philip Jakob Spina, was the idea that regeneration was something that indeed was imparted through the sacrament of baptism, but was also something that could be lost and then subsequently through grace regained. 
this adaptation of Grosskabauer opened the door, doctrinally at least, for distinct conversion experiences to be accounted for in the life of a Christian. This did not suddenly lead to a flowering of conversion or conversion type experiences in German pietism, though there were some, such as Johann Jakob Schutz in the 1670s, who talked about conversion experiences, and there were a few others. But with the emergence of the pietist controversies in the mid to late 1680s, especially in the city of Leipzig, where a movement developed around August Hermann Franke and his allies, they developed conventicle groups that began with Franke's study group, the Collegium Filio Biblicum, an academic colloquium that turned from scholarly questions about the Bible to something much more devotional. Out of this religious fervor, a revival, if you will, gripped both students and townspeople. Stories circulated of powerful religious meetings, including lay people and students. The elites were scandalized that charwomen and theology students dared to interpret scripture together. This brought them into conflict with the civil and church authorities who were aghast at the unsanctioned religious activities and hitherto unknown displays of spiritual intensity. Among the new expressions of religious experience were conversion narratives. Heinrich Julius Ehlers, who later labored with August Hermann Franke in the famous Halle orphanage, recounted how he and Franke would meet in Leipzig with many students each day who would come to their rooms in turmoil amid the process of conversion and ask how they might be righteously converted to God. And Ehlers told how each evening they would record many of these experiences. In fact, Franke had himself a powerful conversion experience in 1687 that he later recorded that is today, without question, the best known conversion experience in German pietism and which is worth recounting again. Franke had gone to the city of Lüneburg for several months in late 1687 and as a candidate for ministry, Franke at this point had his master's degree, he would have been invited to deliver a sermon. This invitation though provoked a crisis in Franke, one that had been building for some time. He felt that although he was learned in theology and the Bible, it was all in his head and not in his heart. He felt he had no true faith, even as his friends and mentors sought to convince him otherwise. His atheistic mind caused him to question the truth of the Bible. Finally, one Sunday evening, as his distress intensified even more, Franke described how he fell to his knees in his room and implored God to save him from his doubts and unbelief. I cried to God, whom I still did not know nor trust for salvation from such a miserable state, asking him to save me if indeed he was a true God. Franke had been agonizing for days, but this evening on his knees, the response was different. Franke wrote, he immediately heard me. My doubt vanished as quickly as one turns one's hand. I was assured in my heart of the grace of God in Christ Jesus, and I knew God not only as God, but as my father. All sadness and unrest of my heart was taken away at once, and I was immediately overwhelmed as with a stream of joy, so that with full joy I praised and gave honor to God, who had shown me such grace. I arose a completely different person from the one who had knelt down. If you know one conversion experience from German pietism, it is likely this vivid account. About three years later, Franke committed to paper the version we have, which he embedded into a longer autobiographical narrative. But the plot of the autobiography turns around his conversion story. And even though many dramatic things occurred to Franke after his conversion itself took place, the autobiography concludes with the conversion account and how it shaped his life from that point on a phrase that he repeated several times to signal how this had irrevocably shaped his life. The account has a literary quality. Some conversion narratives are rough hewn and flow very unevenly, and at times their description seems clumsy or foreign to us today. But Franca's is deliberately structured and carefully composed in an immediate first person voice that draws the reader in. As a result of this conversion, Franca could exclaim, it was as if I had spent my whole life in a deep sleep and everything to this point had only been a dream and I had just woken up. It was as if I had been dead and now saw that I was alive. And it also seems to stand the test of time 
When my students at Emory read Franca's account over 300 years later, many of whom come from Wesleyan and Baptist traditions, they immediately recognize this pattern of talking about conversion. Some occasionally acknowledge that they themselves have similar experiences. Franca's account has had a remarkable staying power. This account reflects an enthusiasm for conversion that Franca and others inculcated. They talked and wrote a great deal about conversion. Language of conversion peppers their writings from Franca's earliest sermons and tracks to his musings later in life. You could say that pietists yearned for conversion, talked about it, encouraged it, but what those pietists, especially those connected to Franca and Halle, didn't do was publish many accounts of conversion experiences. This surprised me. In part, you have to understand that pietists published a lot. Sermons, devotional tracts, treatises, and Bibles. They pioneered at Halle early mass production of Bibles. Here is an image of the complex in Halle where August Hem and Franke and his allies had a major printing operation, and they could pretty much have published whatever they would have liked, but they didn't publish conversion accounts. And while historians often point to August Hem and Franke's conversion as paradigmatic for pietism, the model, as it were, for pietist conversion, it was never published during his lifetime. It first appeared to print in 1733, and then not again really until the end of the 18th century. After that, it took off as the conversion account in German pietism and became widely dispersed in the literature. It would be no mistake to say that Franke's conversion account was better known in the 19th century than it was in the 18th. Given its supposed model character, this is quite surprising to me as I got deeper into the research on conversion. Some have argued that everyone knew the story because it was part of some oral tradition at Halle and repeated all the time, but there are good indications that that wasn't the case. At one point, I wondered, in fact, if August Hem and Franke had moved away from his youthful understanding of his conversion experience. What one thinks about a formative moment in one's youth can, of course, change over time. Such experiences are not necessarily stable in one's recollections or value of it. Later in life, for instance, John Wesley distanced himself from his Aldersgate experience in 1738, where famously his heart was strangely warmed in London, under pietist influence, I might add. But in the few autobiographical statements I could find, especially those at the end of his life, Franke did not seem to have changed his estimation of the Lüneburg conversion, but deliberately chose not to recount it or spread it widely. So we know that pietists were abuzz about conversion in the late 1680s and the early 1690s, and that they were writing down in manuscript many conversion experiences, especially in circles around Franca. But they very rarely published any of these, even though pietists published a great deal of religious literature. Why did pietists become worried about conversion accounts, and what might this tell us about their understanding of religious experience? Almost from the start, there was a kind of principled concern about accounts of conversion. Franke's mentor, in fact, Philip Jakob Spener, voiced several concerns early on. Spener worried that a culture of producing conversion narratives, something by the way he identified with the English, could have two deleterious effects. First, he worried that publishing conversion accounts would create an artificial model and an expectation that others would shape their own spiritual lives on these accounts rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to guide them according to his plan. Imitation rather than authenticity would be the result. And second, he was concerned that setting up paradigmatic models would cause Christians who might be among the regenerate, the reborn, but who had never had a distinct conversion experience, would then come to question their own salvation, thereby sowing doubt when none is warranted. It's not clear that Franke shared Spener's reservations entirely, especially at first when he and Ehlers seemed to be collecting such experiences. But Spener may have discouraged Franke from publishing his conversion narrative, which we know he had sent to Spener in manuscript. But other problems also arose. Some of Franke's disciples pursued conversion so strongly that a new term entered the pietist vocabulary, Bekehrsucht, an obsession to convert others. 
A Berlin pietist in the 1690s associated with both Franke and Spener by the name of Johann Porst described how before his true conversion, he zealously fell into a Bekehrsucht, this drive to achieve conversion, and sought to convert everyone, punish all manner of sins, and reform everything all at once. Only after his own heartfelt conversion could he recognize how wrong-headed he had been and praise God's providence that had prevented him from falling into further disorder of rapidly wanting to convert people. Bekehrsucht, this unhealthy compulsion to convert others, remained a concern for pietists for many years. Other problems also arose. One issue that became especially vexing for pietists was the problem of a converted individual who described his or her conversion in detail, often earning praise from pietist lead leaders, but then either falling away, lapsing back into their previous sinful life, or coming to doubt the reality of their own conversion. For instance, Peter Leidenek, a soldier whose dramatic path to conversion was prominently featured in Johann Heinrich Reitz's Historia der Wiedergeborenen, shown here in the first edition, later relapsed into the ways of his former life, appearing to falsify the authenticity of the earlier conversion. In subsequent editions, Reitz excised his conversion narrative from his collection altogether. But in doing so, he also raised questions about whether one could trust such experiences of living individuals. Another problem was that of an individual who came to doubt whether she or he was truly converted despite an earlier conversion experience. Franke encountered this firsthand with a young woman who had been a teacher at the orphanage in Halle and who was a good friend to his wife. Mata Margareta von Schoenberg was from the lower nobility and had been drawn to the pietist movement after she heard a sermon from Franke in Halberstadt in the early 1690s that had, as she related it, led to her own conversion. Her description followed a typical pietist pattern of stirring of the soul, a period of struggle, and then a breakthrough to grace. She moved to Halle to be close to the heart of the pietist movement. But 10 years later, when she fell ill and was dying, she began to have grave doubts about her salvation. Many pietists were unnerved by this turn of event. What did it mean if a pillar of the pietist movement, who had previously had a conversion experience, no longer considered herself a child of God and truly converted? In his funeral sermon, Franke rescued von Schoenberg's experience by interpreting the struggles she experienced at the end of her life as one where the individual is purified through the furnace of affliction, just as gold and silver are refined, following the passage from Isaiah 48.10. But implicitly, he also devalued her earlier conversion experience itself and put a new focus on death and dying as definitive for understanding religious experience. A further problem for pietists were those who had conversion experiences and then moved in heterodox directions. In one case, the tack maker, Johann Georg Rosenbach von Heidelberg published his own rather lengthy conversion experience, Wunde and Gnadenvolle Bekehrung, or Conversion Full of Wonder and Grace, here in a 1704 edition, that sounded a lot like a conversion experience that could have emanated from Halle. It included anguished repentance, struggle, falling to one's knees, and many, many tears. Franke and his colleagues at first embraced Rosenbach and invited him to come to them as the Lutheran Orthodox clergy in Erlangen were persecuting him. But Rosenbach also came to have heterodox views from the pietist point of view. For instance, he began to openly question whether infant baptism was in fact biblical. Rosenbach questioned the Lutheran interpretation of the Eucharist, and he criticized regular clerical preaching in the churches. So here is an individual who appears fully converted, and yet his experiences do not correlate with their idea of right doctrine. What does that say about the validity of his conversion experience he had claimed? Could it have been true and God-given, or was his conversion somehow an illusion? These things all led many pietists, especially those associated with August Hem and Franke, but also others in the broader movement to be suspicious of the religious experiences that were at the heart of many conversion narratives. They didn't give up on conversion as such, but they sought to constrain and guide it in particular paths that had severe consequences 
for how conversion came to be understood among many German pietists. This also led to a series of distortions among pietists who had trouble trusting in religious experience. One distortion was an attempt to control the conversion narrative. One way that happened was in the form of narration. Franke and many other pietists came to emphasize a kind of third person narration of conversion for accounts that came from lay people. This may sound like a small thing, but it interposed an interpretive layer on the accounts of the laity. What is striking here is that most approved narratives of conversion by the laity were retold by pietist clergy or other pietist leaders who were able to exercise a measure of control, especially over doctrinal account. I would not say that they falsify conversion accounts, but they worked as gatekeepers, especially excluding accounts they might object to, so the conversion narratives would confirm the right theological conviction. Those that did leave behind first-person accounts of conversion were overwhelmingly clergy and theological students. This excluded almost all women from first-person narration of their conversion. This is a powerful contrast to the British context where almost all narratives were in the first person, including those by women. A second distortion was a highly regimented way of understanding the process of conversion in order to ensure true conversion had occurred. As Spener had recognized, the path to salvation and the experiences that accompanied it was manifold. But some pietists, including Samuel Lau in Venegarode and Karl Heinrich Zacharie in Dargun, began to prescribe a particular path to salvation in the 1730s that ensured the validity of conversion by emphasizing the necessity of going through a rigorous Buskampf, or a repentance struggle that ensured that there was sufficient contrition and depth of repentance so that the conversion itself would be valid. The idea of a Buskampf had been around since the early 1690s and was used occasionally by August Hemann Franke, but Lau and Zacharie made it into all but a necessary stage through which one must pass if a conversion were to be true and sure. Ideally, one could not be the judge of whether the Buskampf was sufficient, Self-delusion is powerful, but another, especially a pietist clergyman, would be the judge whether one had struggled and agonized long enough and could move on to a breakthrough to grace and true conversion. And in the archives, there are some heartrending stories of clergy pressing parishioners to go deeper into their struggles over repentance, almost to the point of despair and sometimes beyond. The third distortion was a focus on death that came to predominate in many German pietist understandings of conversion. It took me some time to understand how powerful this was in this context. On one level, it was practical. Only when someone has reached the end of their life can one really judge that a conversion was itself authentic. Or to put it in other terms, once an individual had died, it would be impossible for them to falsify an earlier conversion experience by future impious actions or heterodoxy. The Peter Leideneck problem, the soldier who had a prominent conversion appeared, at least outwardly, to be a converted Christian for a time, but then who lapsed back into his pre-converted patterns of life, is resolved if one waits until the individual had died before publicizing a conversion narrative. In fact, this is what occurred among pietists. Almost no conversion experiences were published before the death of the individual. Only after they had passed away would an older conversion narrative that had been written decades before be dusted off and published. This was the case even for the most prominent pietists. This reflects, I would suggest, a deep uneasiness about the religious experiences that were at the heart of these accounts, as if one could only really be sure about that experience if the individual were really dead. Rather than an extensive literature on conversion experiences, this focus on death also led to the distinctly German pietist genre of spiritual biography, the so-called last hours, which recounted the struggles and tribulations of dying Christians in the last days of their lives, as they were, like Franke's co-worker, Mata Margareta von Schönberg, prepared for unification with Christ through spiritual struggle. The last hours deserve their own analysis, but the focus on death also encouraged another form of the conversion narrative, the execution conversion narrative. These conversion accounts were of individuals who had committed a capital crime and had been sentenced to death. 
In early modern Germany, there were usually several weeks between the judgment of a sentence and the time at which the execution would take place. The clergy had long been charged with providing pastoral counsel to condemn prisoners, and the pietist clergy in particular took this on as a particular priority in order to convert criminals into true Christians before the sentence was carried out. The pietist clergy produced vivid accounts of their efforts, and many of the most popular narratives began with lurid accounts of the crime. One, Christian Ritter in Mecklenburg, for instance, viciously murdered an elderly peasant couple in the course of a robbery. After he was apprehended and arrested, the account described how the initial efforts of the pietists were in vain. He sold the Bible the clergy had given him and hardened his heart against the pietists' attempts. But through hard and intensive work, the account described how the pietist clergy slowly won his trust and brought Ritter to a true recognition of his sinfulness, not just the crime for which he was convicted. Leading him through a powerful repentance experience, he eventually had a breakthrough to grace and joyous conversion. He no longer dreaded his execution. He had been sentenced to being broken on the wheel. And you can see here a detail of that in the lower right-hand corner. But he went to his execution willingly and joyfully, according to the account, calling it his wedding day because of his anticipation of union with Christ after his death. There is a lot to be critical of in these narratives, ethically and theologically. The conversion took place in a quasi-coercive environment, and the clergy were among the few who had access to the prisoner and put him under a full court press for conversion with clergy or theology students visiting him every morning and afternoon for weeks. When I first encountered these accounts, I found them somewhat macabre oddities. But I came to realize that these execution narratives were the most popular print version of conversion experiences in 18th century Germany. They were printed and reprinted more than any other kind of account. And indeed, they checked many of the boxes for these pietists. They were told in the third person, usually by clergymen who attended the prisoner awaiting execution. They were doctrinally correct. The clerical authorship and intervention ensured that they reinforced correct doctrine and the proper order of conversion unfolded. And the story of a hardened criminal, the worse the crime, generally the better, who then became a converted Christian emphasized the universality and power of God's grace, a central theological point for Lutheran pietists. And naturally, they included a focus on death in that the accounts always ended with the execution of the individual when these narratives universally accepted his or her death, willingly going to the gallows or the ravenstone to face the executioner. In the light of the fact that the accounts ended in death, Conversion was never a grounds for commuting the sentence. The narratives presented an unfalsifiable conversion experience. These accounts circulated in broadsides and then pamphlets. Here is a rare example of such a broadside from Pennsylvania in German that contained such a conversion narrative. And many were then collected in several popular books that were themselves reprinted and widely circulated. They appear to be popular, in my reckoning, more popular than any other form of conversion narrative in 18th century Germany, maybe too popular. One side effect was a particular kind of execution narrative, the form of suicide by proxy, as Kathy Stewart calls it, in which an individual kills someone, usually a young child whose salvation is not in question, in order to be condemned to death by the authorities. The peculiar pietist twist on this was not only did the individual want to die at the hand of another, hence suicide by proxy, but also wanted to have a true conversion before the execution. There are a few but well-documented cases of this. Here is a pamphlet published just a few days after the execution, which took place in the county of Anagaroda. In this account, a young servant named Gertrude Magdalena Bremel murdered an innocent child in her care after she became despondent when a love affair had gone wrong. She immediately presented herself to the local authorities and confessed her crime, saying she hoped to die in the glorious fashion that is fully converted that she had observed in an execution she had once seen. This horrified the clerical and civil authorities, 
that she would commit a crime in order to have a righteous conversion. And they worked to convince her of the wrongness of her interpretation and bring her to right understanding of Christian teaching. In the end, they succeeded, and she went to the Ravenstone, as the place of execution was known, assured of her true conversion, which is ironically precisely what she had set out to do in the first place. The extreme distortion of suicide by proxy destabilized this way of understanding conversion and the intimate connection to death. Enlightenment clergy loathed not only the rapid transformation of villains into model Christians, which seemed to undermine morality, but also found the histrionics around such conversions distasteful. In some ways, suicide by proxy was a logical outcome of the focus on death and conversion and the problems it engendered helped topple this model of conversion by the last quarter of the 18th century. This in turn made it possible to establish Franca's conversion experience as the model of pietist conversion after decades when it had been nearly forgotten. I've talked about the distortions on the part of pietists, of course, but there were distortions on the other side as well. Many non-pietist clergy, the so-called Orthodox, couldn't accept the possibility of powerful religious experiences at work among pietists. They mocked their prayer circles where individuals were overcome with emotion, and they gleefully told stories of meetings, for instance in Haberstadt, where a young man fainted in his fervor to be converted and had to be carried out, that was recounted in a delightfully entitled expose from 1693 called The Extensive Description of Mischief. We might be skeptical here of both the pietists and the anti-pietists, and it would be obtuse to imagine that there were no excesses among the pietists, but it is also the case that the Orthodox had trouble coming to terms with any legitimate religious experiences at all, especially related to conversion. Very early on stories circulated of so-called Quaker powders that were supposedly used to induce conversions. Quakers were few and far between in Germany, but their name was practically synonymous with ecstatic religious experiences. The connection between medicinal concoctions and conversion experiences did not just so circulate as folk legends. A scholarly dissertation from the University of Rostock in 1707, reprinted several times, discussed the so-called English and Dutch Quaker powders that were supposedly employed to, to induce powerful bodily and spiritual experiences. During later revivals among pietists in which conversions were common, outlandish stories circulated of the pietists sneaking powder into the bread and butter of unsuspecting villagers in order to surreptitiously convert them. One story went that pietists would sprinkle some of the powder on the seat of a chair and when one sat down, as soon as it becomes warm, it strikes into the blood and causes anxiety and pain so that one becomes frantic and, they would add, therefore ripe for conversion. These were at least naturalistic explanations. Some supposed Jimson weed might have been an ingredient which could have had hallucinogenic effects, though that is not likely. And pietists did use medicines frequently, especially the elixir Essentia Dulcis, which was produced in Halle and one of its best sellers, but it had no psychopharmacological effects. There were also more ominous allegations of magic or occult practices at work in conversion. There were frequent stories that pietists wrote magical symbols or phrases on slips of paper and had their followers ingest them to induce a conversion. The church cantor in one town in Mecklenburg in the 18th century had sought to convert a woman who had been sentenced to death for infanticide and was caught up in a wave of hysteria among the townspeople, alleging that he had employed magic in order to convert the woman. One commonly repeated rumor was that he had given her pieces of paper with magical words to eat. More likely, he had written out some verses of a hymn by hand on a scrap of paper. With the support of some local clergy, a, the the local duke had the poor cantor arrested and tortured in order to wring a confession out of him. He never confessed and was eventually released to the great embarrassment of the duke, but not before his hands had been so mangled that he was unable to play musical instruments again. Other tales are more fantastical. One young man related that he had been in a pietist gathering and they had given him a piece of paper to eat. Instead of swallowing it, he pocketed it in his cheek and then when he left the gathering, he spit it out into his hand and the paper turned into a toad and hopped away. We can laugh at some of these stories, 
but modern historians have had their own way of eliding religious experience. One historian of women criminals surveyed the execution conversion narratives that were so popular in the 18th century, and as she noticed certain structural similarities, she became suspicious of their veracity. In more than one of these stories, she noticed that the condemned uttered a phrase just before execution, oh, I see the heaven open above, Lord Jesus, receive my soul, which for this historian was a sign that they were concocted and subject to the hand of a heavy editor, if true at all. She dismissed them as fundamentally fictitious. I'm not sure she recognized that the similar phrasing was in fact a near quotation from Acts 7 and the martyrdom of St. Stephen, which would have been part of the catechizing of those in this situation. Moreover, in many of these cases, especially the problematic Bremel case of suicide by proxy, there was a very strong archival record that the account was not just a fiction, but a reasonably accurate depiction of what the woman had said or done. These accounts do not give us access to the condemned's inner life, but neither can we dismiss her experiences as fictions altogether. And this was the problem with pietists and conversion. They held it up as a model, but in the end, they didn't really trust these experiences. They looked for ways to constrain, to control, to limit it. This led to distortions that I've described this evening, which discouraged lay people from describing their religious experiences and introduced a focus on the finality of death that seemed to resolve the problems, but actually created new ones. There were other options. 18th century Methodists in Britain, for instance, were much more open to, to the validity of conversion and the way in which that religious experience was described. Occasionally, that led to enthusiasm in their own distortions, as Hogarth described in this unforgettable engraving entitled Enthusiasm Delineated from the 18th century that mocked the Methodists. But in the end, this approach granted lay people more agency over their religious and spiritual lives than in many forms of German pietism. Of course, the accounts themselves are not records of the actual religious experiences. Even in autobiography, there is always a distance between the account and the actual experience. Memory, even strong memories are subject to all kinds of shading, and an author may sometimes employ misdirection and occasionally even outright falsification. But that distance does not mean that the experiences that lay behind these accounts were untrue or merely imaginary. Moreover, as historians, it strikes me that we have an ethical responsibility to those represented in our sources. The account of Bremel's conversion is our only record of her religious life. It may be biased and tendentious, Without a doubt, her conversion took place under extraordinarily difficult circumstances and in a quasi-coercive environment where multiple clergy visited her, pressured her morning and afternoon in order to affect her conversion. Yet her statements in the conversion narrative and in the speech she gave to the assembled crowd are the only utterances we have of this deeply troubled woman's story. As historians, we have an obligation not to treat them as fictions or mere concoctions of the clergy, but also to read them generously and not immediately discount the agency of the individuals and their religious experiences as mere fabrication. Spener, it seems to me, may have gotten it about as right as any of the pietists. Unlike Franca, he did not want to create a culture of conversion that he could tightly control, and his understanding of conversion and regeneration was in many ways far broader. At the same time, he was not as quick to discount the diversity of religious experiences he encountered when they seemed to be at variance with his own expectations. Franca and those who followed him in the 18th century seemed to think they knew precisely what true conversion was and could control and channel it. But in the end, that meant that they really couldn't trust conversions and the religious experiences that lay behind them at all, and that distorted their meaning. Ironically, it took nearly a century of distortions before lay Christians could use Franca's own autobiographical account to rethink what conversion might mean in new ways. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Strom, for, uh, for that lecture. Really fascinating. And um, 
uh, I think we have uh, at least one question here already. And uh, I have several questions. Uh, having heard your lecture and having uh, uh, read your book, um, maybe I'll begin with a question um, uh, that that it connects with with uh, you know where where you ended when you talked about you know there there were other options. Um, I was I'm I'm curious why why do you think German Pietism uh, ended up going in one direction when um, for example uh, British Methodism seems to have a, a different uh, a different approach. Yeah, that's a really good question, and it's one that I've wrestled with a lot. Um, I. I think it comes down to, and this is, you know, one of the arguments I'm I'm making is that even though Pietists wanted to emphasize religious experience, they were still very troubled by it, and they had a hard time trusting it. And I, I think that that hesitancy really made it difficult for them to embrace conversion experiences. And so that's something that they actually shared with their opponents, the, ortho, the so-called Orthodox, who were also very distrustful of religious experience. So they wanted to channel it in, in very particular ways. And I, I will give you know, the British tradition and, and British evangelicalism, it's not just the, the Wesleyan Methodist tradition, but they were much more open to it. They were open to conversion experiences where people then laid aside their you know, Methodist credentials and then fell away. And they, they didn't necessarily say we have to suppress those stories. And so I think in the end, it actually led to a situation where there was much greater openness to having kinds of embracing certain kinds of religious experience, which doesn't mean taking them all at face value. I mean, that's, that's part of the issue. But I think the, the German pietists in particular were much more constrained in that sense. And this kind of, this version of evangelicalism um, tended to be much more held in certain bounds. You know, they didn't do things like open air preaching, um, which is one of the other big differences between pietists in Germany and let's say evangelicals in Britain, where you had these large open air preaching. The, the Germans still did almost all their preaching, even their evangelical preaching in the church you know, from a pulpit in a very traditional way. So I, I think this fits with some larger categories, but I, I think it was hard for them to come to terms with religious experience. Hmm. Uh, uh, the, your example of, of, uh, of um, just, just uh, spirituality in traditional forms, like in the church, uh, then that sort of takes me in a different direction. I was going to ask before you, before you mentioned that, I was going to ask what was the, um, what was the the role of the idea of baptismal regeneration? I mean, you had mentioned that earlier. Like, that, is that a, a strongly constraining um, factor? But it sounds like there are other factors as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's always the case where doctrine um, doctrine will shade how people understand things. And I, I think in the Lutheran case in particular, the notion of baptismal regeneration, which I think there can be a really rich theology around it. I realize I'm speaking to those, you know, largely from a believer's baptism tradition, but that was a very powerful theological notion that made it very difficult for them to talk about certain kinds of distinctive, particularly regeneration and conversion being a new moment in the life. You know, they always wanted to tie it back to baptism, but that then created some other issues for them. The Calvinists got around it by a different direction by not having baptismal regeneration at all, right? So they're able to go, get around it in another way. There's the kind of Anabaptist or believer's baptism way, which then moves in another direction. And I think my point there is that doctrine does affect how people interpret religious experience. And so, you know, Methodists, which have a much more open understanding of predestination than Lutherans or Calvinists, then are much more comfortable with someone in a sense falling away from a particular, um, a particular religious experience that might have been defining at one point, but less so later. Mm -hmm. um, want to uh, remind our audience, if you have questions, uh, please enter them in the, uh, the Q&A uh, feature. Um, we have one uh, question um, asking, how did uh, 20th century evangelical conversion narratives compare with pietist narratives? And I'm assuming the question here is assuming, you know, North American, maybe US um, evangelical conversion uh, narratives. Uh, how, how would you compare those with the uh, German 
uh, pietist narratives that that you've been talking about? Yeah, well, I think there are I think there are some real um, parallels in some ways, and this is why one reason why I think that Franca's conversion narrative itself um, has become so powerful in the historiography is because it corresponds pretty well with many certain ways of understanding conversion in the 20th century. And, you know, we have to be very careful of what uh, describing what precisely is a conversion experience and, you know, sociologists of religion and psychologists of religion have different ways of interpreting what constitutes that. But what we would sort of think is a classic evangelical conversion. When my students who come out of these traditions read Franca, they identify with that. Some will come up at, later after class and say, you know, Dr. Strom, this happened to me. And they'll go on and they'll explain it. So that one works very well. I think though some of the other German conversion narratives are from the early pietist movement, even the mid pietist movement are just much more foreign to us. So there is one um, by a fellow by the name of Shada and his, he, had, he was a friend of Franca, he knew Schweiner. He had a conversion narrative, but it was one of just deep, deep struggle his entire life. It never has this moment of breakthrough where on the other side, you know, life was really different. And this is one of the things that's in Franca's narrative is from this point on, you know, I was really changed at this point. And Shada's account, which is in many respects a conversion narrative, and it was actually read more frequently than Franca's in early pietism, would be one that I think my students would have a very difficult time understanding because it's all about the providence of God all the way through, even though he never really reaches this glorious breakthrough and sort of moment of grace. And so I, I think part of my question is that we simply not look for pietist conversion narratives that look a lot like our contemporary ones. And Franca's, I think, works in that way. But then we also look at this variety. And some of these are really, I think, difficult for us. The execution conversion narratives are just very, very challenging on many different levels. And um, in some ways, they're fun to read. Students like them. You know, they have a, they're like a reading a, you know, a kind of a murder mystery. There's a difficult crime at the beginning that they describe in great detail. And then they go through and show this person moving towards a true Christianity that then ends always with an execution. So you kind of get, you know, what I think of in the sort of in an 18th century pious, you know, dramatic story that people kind of liked. On the other hand, those are very foreign to us today. We wouldn't use those as sort of models of, um, a pietist conversion. And, and the Enlightenment figures really dislike this because they wanted the Christian life to be sort of a moral life, right? It would be in comport with your, if you, you can't just change on a dime and suddenly become a different person, you, you need, this needs to be a longer process that's inculcated. And so they really thought that the, the kind of celebration of these criminals now almost as martyrs as they go to their execution was completely wrong and in some ways deeply, deeply um, disturbing. Uh, and I, I remember, if, if, I think I remember, uh, in, in reading your book that there's, there you make reference to um, the reaction against the, these um, uh, suicide by proxy accounts one of the things that even motivated in Denmark uh, discussion about the abolition of capital punishment um, is that is that do I remember that or is that I mean that's a, a kind of uh, ironic uh, twist on these uh, death sentence uh, conversion stories well right so they they thought they were too it, it seemed that an easy way out so I mean it, when you say abolition of the death penalty it's not really an abolition of the punishment and so what they wanted to do was not make an easy, glorious end, but they would sentence them to life at hard labor um, or that in which their life expectancy would simply be a couple of years. I mean, they were, they were very brutal conditions. So they almost always within a few years ended in their death, but it was supposed to then move them away from sort of wanting this kind of glorious execution. And, you know, they were public events and public spectacles. So here's this person, in the center and then you know sometimes they describe them going to their wedding day that was a common image or their preachers you know lay preachers to the crowd and they wanted to remove that um what seemed to be you know compelling them into these behaviors by then saying no we're going to sentence you to hard labor but in the end it, it's not any it, it, it's 
not any kinder, if anything, it's almost more difficult because the life expectancy is so short in those kinds of situations. Um, another question uh, that's come in here. Um, do you see a connection between the pietist conversion narratives that you were describing and uh, Moravian, Moravian uh, Lebenslaufe, which included conversion, but also a life summary uh, and a somewhat often formulaic, a formulaic account of death? Yeah. Um, well, there are a couple of things there. So the, the Lebensläufe are really interesting um, comparisons to this. Um, some of them have conversions in them. What's um, striking about some of the Moravians, though, is, you know, later as they're sort of writing and sometimes someone else is finishing it out and looking back, they kind of show that they change towards the end of their life. Um, and they're not always so edifying. I know in some of the connection, some of the collection of Katie Fowle, you know, they're sort of writing, here's someone at one point that appeared to be converted, and at the, then later they were, um, they seemed to be much less certain about what had happened. They were not necessarily happy at the end of their life in all cases. Um, so they are also, and this is one of the questions, are the Lebensläufe really conversion narratives? Now, I think that they are. Um, but I think we have to also expand what our understanding of, um, of conversion stories are to a certain extent. I also think they contain this, you really judge a life by the end of the life. You look back from the point of death at this pivotal moment between, you know, between death and eternal salvation. And it seems to me that's they share a lot with the last hours in that respect. Um, I think the formulaic nature of death is, um, you know, is very interesting. What I think they don't have, though, is what this kind of pietist fetish with the struggle of, you know, and they're using the chat from Isaiah, this idea of the furnace of affliction, that that's sort of purifying them for death. And I, I don't think the Lebensläufe has that in the same way, but I, I have to admit, I'm not as deeply into the Lebensläufe as some other uh, stories. And they, of course, largely were not published um, during the person's lifetime. And that's also one of the characteristics of the German pietist narratives is they didn't publish them during the lifetime because they're very worried, I think, about falsification. Mm -hmm. uh, another question um, uh, related to the, the, um, the, the accounts of uh, conversion of criminals uh, facing, uh, facing execution. You said these were some of the most popular accounts that were published were um, other deathbed conversions, but not related to execution, but deathbed um, conversions, were those also um, uh, especially popular publications? Like is, uh, when you talk about the importance of death, it, it, it includes uh, these so-called deathbed conversions as well in terms of popularity? Yeah, um, I mean, that's a really interesting point about the deathbed conversions because the pietists really worried about deathbed conversions. Hmm. And uh, that was one of the, actually their big concerns because what they didn't want was someone to wait until the end of their life in order to hope for a conversion. So actually they were very, very hesitant to publish deathbed conversions, which doesn't mean they didn't exist. And what they did publish in a couple of cases were narratives of people who seemed to almost have a deathbed conversion but died before it was able to end. And there was a story of one school teacher who seemed to be almost on the path, you know, he grew ill, he goes to his death, you know, to his deathbed, he's there and then, but he never really makes it. And there's, the, they describe him turning against, you know, with his eyes against the looking at the wall and said, it's over, it's finished for me. And then the story was very unclear. This maybe was not a deathbed conversion. It was almost a warning don't wait. So they were very, very worried about the waiting for the, you know, the sort of the deathbed moment in order to have a true conversion. Um, so I think the deathbed conversions were not uh, stories that they publicized. And that's, of course, part of it. We only get the filter of what they wanted to publicize. But I, and there were one or two that I can think of, but this, there are also one or two of these warning stories. This could be you. If you wait to your deathbed, you might not make it until the end. Another question. Could you say a bit more about the spiritual struggle as a part of the conversion process? Why was this seen as a necessary part of conversion for uh, the pietists? Uh, I assume this meaning that the struggle. And more broadly, uh, if or when did spiritual struggle become less important 
in their understanding of conversion? Yeah. Um, well, spiritual, spiritual struggle, and in, in, in German, you know, they call it the Buskampf, um, is a phrase that's been around, you know, it, it begins in the early pietist movement, but it wasn't a very fixed pay, uh, phrase. It could mean a whole lot of different things. And in German, Busse, this notion of repentance and Bekehrung were often linked together. That's a very old linkage that goes back actually to the Reformation. And that's this notion of ongoing repentance. What was new was really this sort of deep, deep struggle. And it shows up episodically in the, maybe the first 30 years of pietism, but then it becomes a particular moment you have to get through in order to have a true conversion. And my interpretation of this is why it became so important for certain pietists was a way to show, how do we know if this is a true conversion or is it a false conversion? And what proved to be the true conversion was the depth of that particular struggle. So it's a, it's a way in a sense of ensuring, how do we know this isn't just somebody who had a couple of, they use the word stirrings, just a few you know, pricks of the conscience and said, oh, by the way, I'm converted now and I'm fine. How do they separate that person from somebody who's really had this powerful experience? And, and so in certain pietist movements and not all, it becomes then this moment you have to go through. And there are some really terrible, you know, deeply disturbing stories. One of the advocates of it, the, you know, his son is kind of in these struggles and he's come down and he'd explain it to his dad and he'd say, you know, I'm going through this. And he goes, no, that's not enough. You got to go up to your room and pray more and hope more, you know. And finally, of course, he makes it and the story describes this, you know, the celebration in the household that he finally had this breakthrough. Um, the problem was, of course, that's prescribing a very, you know, schematic way that conversion should take place. And I, you know, I think this is, goes back to Spener's observation early on in the Pietist movement that there are many different ways of having conversion. But I think it was a way again of ensuring because they're unsure themselves on how to judge a spiritual experience. It was their way of judging and say, aha, if there's this, then we know that it's certain. Another question uh, that has come in is, uh, are, um, is, were there patterns of conversion narratives among radical pietists that differed from the, the more mainstream churchly pietists? Um, yes, there, there were, um, although they were, they were not as different as I sometimes thought. So Johann Heinrich Reitz's um, collection of um, conversion narratives or really of, of, of stories the first couple of volumes, the first volume was almost entirely conversion narrative, but then they also shift to become more and more um, sort of spiritual biography as opposed to distinct conversion narratives. And I puzzled over that why that is also the case. Um, I think it becomes as difficult for them as to sort of have a uniform defining experience that they more want to talk about the richness of these different kinds of um, conversion experiences. So in some ways it maps it, but there, there are distinctive ones in the, in the inspired, um, you know, what is actually a conversion experience? Is it actually getting the gift of prophecy that allows you then, does that show, you know, who you are? Um, they're still not overwhelmingly common to see published conversion narratives among the radical pietists. They are, they are somewhat more common, but actually not that, that different in many respects. Now, they themselves are quite critical of some of the pietist conversion narratives, some of the churchly pietist conversion narratives. So it goes back and forth, but um, the, they're not as distinct. Now, I think, um, and I'm, I'm not brethren, and so we could have a discussion of this, but I think in some ways, you know, believer's baptism then provides this really distinctive moment in the life of faith, right? This becomes a kind of moment that you can point to of a sort of before and after. And I think when you have believer's baptism, it reduces to a certain extent the need to have this kind of narrative of my conversion life that says, I am of this particular group. And for the church pietists, you know, where they, they don't have believer's baptism, they sort of need some sort of story. So that's been one reason why I've wondered whether among some of the radical pietists, they haven't needed to have the same kind of conversion narrative. Um, 
Now, a big question is, are whether or not narratives of prophecy are conversion narratives? And I think you can make an argument that they are, um, in which case there are some older Lutheran narratives, even in the, in the early 17th century, but then also particularly among radicals in the, um, radicals in the 18th century, you can see these sort of prophecies. And to a certain extent, I think they fit as conversion narratives. Um, Jakob Böhme, for instance, um, some of his followers in the late 17th century talk about his autobiography, his sort of spiritual biography as being a conversion narrative. And it's very interesting of how they attend to the kind of prophetic element that happens with it by identifying that with conversion. But I, by and large, though, I think there, in some ways, there are real parallels between the radicals and the church pietists. Interesting. Um, as, as an Americanist, I also have to, to ask uh, what uh, connections you see between the uh, published accounts in, um, in Europe and in, so Pennsylvania, for example, you had the, the, the broadside and you said it was uh, un, sort of unusual. Um, and is that unusual because there were few that were published here or unusual because it survived or, uh, but, but how, how are these, how's this tradition of conversion accounts, published conversion accounts, uh, either in collected books or in broadsides. How is that brought to Pennsylvania, for example, or other parts of North America? And how long does it last? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to start with the broadside, the reason the broadside is, is, was very interesting to me, it's the only broadside that I've ever found of these kind of execution broadsides. And it's in a collection that Hermann Wellenreuter edited. Um, that I became aware of. And so that's why I was so interested in. I've searched in Germany for the broadsides. There are records of them. People complain about these broadsides and that they were actually published. And, you know, the, the, the printers, you know, an execution was kind of like, there was a certain kind of carnivalist atmosphere around it. And so the printers would prepare something very quickly, you know, immediately before or immediately afterwards. A lot of times they were sort of a doggerel verse that they would put together, but then also these kind of conversion narratives that would appear immediately afterwards. And so that's the reason that I saw that in Pennsylvania, I was really struck because I haven't seen any other one. I haven't been able to find a, a, an existing one and they're ephemeral literature, so they disappear very quickly. Um, in terms of the um, back and forth, I mean, Jonathan Edwards' um, account of Northampton was translated and you know, read in Germany. And the Germans read a fair amount of both from New England as well as from England. They were translated into German. I have found much less influence going the other direction um, that these that the German accounts were actually read in the British or North American context. Now we know that this Pietist literature was transported in German. Um, you know, there wasn't a fair amount of literature that moved. And so some of these, these books are, are available and would have been available and brought with them. But I even among, you know, particularly I, I looked um, among uh, Muhlenberg and the, you know, the German pietists in Pennsylvania, they're not producing conversion narratives, at least that I have been able to find. It was, I really would look for them and I, I couldn't really find them. Now, in their biographical statements they wrote for Halle, sometimes there was a conversion account in that, but it didn't seem that they created a, a sort of a tradition of conversion accounts in, in North America. So that surprised me. Um, another question uh, that's come in is, uh, have you seen connections between other marks of pietism, such as emphasis on Bible reading or the uh, uh, small group conventicles uh, and those kind of marks of pietism in uh, conversion accounts. So do, do the conversion accounts also reaffirm these other uh, aspects or elements of that, that we associate with pietism? Um, yeah, well, I mean, one of the really interesting things that comes up in a number of the conversion narratives is um, illiterate uh, people or illiterate people who um, very, very quickly learn to read and almost a kind of uh, you know, preternatural way. So uh, the one of the people that I described that initially sold the Bible, 
he was, you know, apparently illiterate, and yet in a couple of weeks of working with the clergy, he was smoothly reading the Bible and then um, be able to account for, you know, read these things on his own and other devotional literature. So he was illiterate, and then within a few weeks had become literate um, in prison. So it this very rapid change, and that shows up, that's a trope that shows up in several of the conversion narratives, which I think reinforces that. Um, the conventicle is a little harder um, to show up in some of the narratives, um, but it's clear that conversions were occurring and related to um, conventicle meetings, and you find that in some of the conversion accounts. So it's the, the, con the problem is that many of the conversion accounts that continue, that exist, are ones that were selected in, for the kinds of things that they showed. So they were also very attentive. And this is one of the problems of, you know, particularly the Lutheran pietists is they wanted them to show correct doctrine. And you can almost see in them sometimes as they're kind of doing a catechizing along the way to get them to the right point so that their Christology, their understanding of grace, everything fits in a, you know, in a kind of pietist Lutheran understanding. And so they're reinforcing that. Um, now, what's interesting is some of the anti-pietists, you know, reflected certain marks of pietism in, uh, in their sort of mockery of conversion. So the very intense prayer practices, for instance, were often said these are, you know, what they'll do is they'll kind of get them all wound up by repeating over and over again certain prayers and so that they would get into a trance and then that would cause the conversion. So they'll use certain other kinds of practices that they associated with pietists or one case, you know, that's almost um, arguing for a kind of sleep deprivation as producing a conversion. And it's a, it's a mockery of a pietist conversion account and that's how they sort of describe it. So I think the, the conversion accounts do reflect exactly some of the larger issues and they did use them, the approved ones were used to kind of reinforce um, sort of uh, pietist tenets that they wanted to reinforce in particular ways. Now, the problem is of course, that had um, these unintended consequences and suicide by proxy, of course, is the, you know, is the most dramatic of all of them. You know, they want to show everyone has the possibility of conversion. Even if you commit a dramatic crime, you have the possibility of conversion. And then you run into these people who then think, well, if I'm going to have a great conversion, maybe what I should do is, you know, commit a crime. So always it would be someone whose salvation is not in danger and then I too could follow this mode. And of course, that's not what, that's not the message they were trying to send. Um, but there are, there, there are multiple stories of this. And, you know, one, one, uh, one story is that a pietist pastor was always trying to run away from this woman who was going to, he, she was so convinced of his, that he was going to be saved and of his goodness that she was going to kill him so that she could have a, uh, a, a good a, a good execution and death as well. And of course, you know, that's a, again, mockery, but you sort of see the, the way that it gets reflected in some of these accounts. Um, I guess one, one final uh, question before this evening. Uh, as a historian, I'm uh, interested in hearing you reflect a bit on how you came to this topic and writing this book. You, you uh, talk a bit about it in the preface, uh, but for folks who haven't read it yet, how, how did you, what was the process or what sparked your interest in taking on this topic? Yeah, I, I was, um, I was really looking, I, I wanted to just find uh, great pietist conversion narratives that I could draw on for another project that I was working on. It was going to be part of another book. And I just wanted to come up with these pietist conversion narratives. And, you know, I knew Franca's narrative and I said, well, I'm just going to go out and gather all these other ones and then I'll put them together. And, you know, that'll sort of be the, the, this, the data that I'm going to use in this section and I'll use it to describe it. And then I would go on to do something else. And what I found was um, there just weren't the conversion narratives out there that I was expecting to find. And everybody talks about conversion. And if you open a, you know, a sermon by Franca or, you know, other ones, they're always talking about it. And I was like, well, where are the conversion narratives? And of course, you know, people would say, well, you know, there's Franca and Franca's was the model for everyone else's. And then I realized, you know, well, hold it. Nobody knew Franca's story during his lifetime. 
and they hardly knew it at all during the 18th century, is no way it could have been a model. So then I tried to figure out, okay, what else is there? And that's, and that's what really led me into a very different project. I started out trying to, working on a very different book and I was gonna look at prophecy and, and conventicles and conversion all together. And then I realized, no, there's no, um, conversion itself needs a lot of explanation. So that's what kind of pulled me into it. And I kept running into questions that I couldn't answer. You know, why, why aren't there conversion narratives? Why, how could people have understood Franca's, you know, his own conversion narrative as a model when it wasn't available and no one seemed to know it. And there, you know, their contemporary accounts were people who describe his spiritual life, who make no reference to his conversion experience at all. So that's why I, that's why I sort of focused on conversion. Um, I'm, you know, I come not from a tradition that has powerful conversion experiences. You know, I'm sort of an old-fashioned Lutheran in that way. Um, but it also got me thinking about, you know, how we how we deal with conversion experiences and how easily they're dismissed by people who theologically think they shouldn't be there. And I think that's a problem for historians. I think historians really have to wrestle with the kinds of things that are happening in their, um, in their sources. And so that's the other side to it. Um, I don't have a personal conversion experience. Um, I have my own religious, deep religious piety, um, but I, I, I resonate a lot with the stories that are there and to try to make sense of them, of what they might mean for, might have meant for those people, but also thinking very carefully of how we use them today for our own purposes, sometimes to justify, sometimes to dismiss. Um, a lot of times, you know, pietist conversion is used to dismiss pietists. And I think that's not a helpful way for us to interact with these sources and what the sources have to tell us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Strom. Uh, thank you for being with us, and I want to uh, highlight again uh, the book, German Pietism and the Problem of Conversion, published by Penn State University Press, copyright 2018. The uh, Dale W. Brown um, Book Award winner for uh, last year uh, for uh, Outstanding Contribution, Anabaptist and Pietist Studies. It's a great book. I uh, recommend it highly, and uh, thank you for uh, being with us this evening. Um, we do need to wrap our time for this evening, but again, want to uh, thank you for being with us and also uh, note uh, that in two weeks uh, from tonight, uh, join us for another Young Center event, a presentation by Samuel and Rebecca Dolly, who will share stories of pain and hope from uh, Northeast Nigeria and their um, roles there with the Church of the Brethren in Nigeria, responding to uh, the church's response to the crisis of Boko Haram violence in, in that area. Uh, that will be next, uh, or in two weeks, uh, Thursday, March 4th, again at 7 p.m. Special thanks this evening to our support staff from uh, uh, ITS Services uh, who made this program possible, and thanks to Elizabethtown College uh, and its support for the Young Center. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>